Okay. Kitsi Kitsi Boa. This is going to be part two of two of my lecture on the ecology of Sa'eki Sum, the duck moon, which is usually the sixth of the seven winter lunar cycles in a Blackfoot calendar year. We talked already in part one about the nesting cycle of the geese, which is the main event that occurs in this in this moon. This is the break of the winter fast and very important. And we talked about some of the other waterfowl. Um, now we're going to move on to plants, insects, other passerines, smaller birds. So what's happening during this lunar cycle most years? Um, one of the important plants to me that I, that I see emerging in the wetlands is Matoyan, Nebraska sedge, um, sometimes also called buffalo grass in English by Blackfoot speakers. And this is, a, this is an important water plant, one of the favored foods of the bison in the past. Um, but also used in ceremony. Um, this is a plant that's gathered and laid down as a bed inside of beaver sweat lodge ceremonies. Um, I've observed the beavers gathering this plant themselves as a uh, as bedding as we move into summer, uh, replacing the bedding that was in their lodge during the winter. This is also a plant that's fed to the um, skull, which serves as an altar of sorts um, as part of the Okan ceremony, which is the main culmination of the sun dance. So if you ever find a, an offering um, of that sort, you know, on a hilltop somewhere with the skull, a buffalo skull um, with his the skull being stuffed with grass. This is the grass that uh, is used. It's Nebraska sedge. By the way, that um, the reason that that skull is stuffed like that is that it represents the first bison that goes over a cliff um, in a bison drive. The first one that goes over is celebrated and uh, its its skull is always made into an altar like that, but they're saved for, some of them will be saved for uh, the sun dance, for the Okan um, in the past. Of course, now there's no bison, but and there's a special name for that first one that goes over. I forget what that is, but I've, I've seen that name before, that first bison that goes over the cliff. One of the flowers that you'll see around the coolies is the snow snow starts to melt is uh, moss phlox, small white, these five petaled flower um, coming out of moss looking plants. This is how they look close up. I don't know of any use for them, um, any traditional medicinal or food uses or anything like that, but they're really uh, almost the first flower I ever see here. Not quite the first, but pretty close each year. Um, this is hairy fruited parsley, which grows on the uh, animal trails, the game trails that follow the ridge tops of the coolies. And so it, it uses those trails because it, it likes the exposed areas, so the trails are worn, uh, generally of other plants. And this one endures a lot of hardship. You can you know, this one's going to get stepped on by animals and it's going to be all right. Uh, but most of the other plants don't don't fare so well when the animals pass by, you know, repeatedly. So this one makes use of that. And it's a, it's a parsley, so it's a food plant. You can eat the whole thing. The greens, the, the root is probably, you know, in the past, the thing that's most um, of interest to the people because... The root, root is a nice, like, starchy um, root. And you need carbs. <laughs> you 
in addition to bison meat, you know. Kipiapi. This is a flower that's usually noted as the first flower um, of the season, but it's it's never the first flower. It's about, you know, where I am, it might be the fourth or fifth flower that opens in the coolies. Kipiapi in Blackfoot means it's it's just a like a brief glimpse of an eye. <laughs> Because these plants just show up quickly, you can see them, and then they're going to be gone, and they'll leave no trace. You know, there's no foliage left um, when they're when they're gone, or you know, you don't notice it. At least they kind of disappear. The prairie crocus. Um, I've heard that you can use the foliage of prairie cro crocus as a kind of a poultice. Um, for aching joints, rheumatoid syndrome and such. Tried it with Adrian once and it didn't seem to do, to be very effective. Maybe it's, you know, her case is very severe. So, um, maybe that, maybe that it works in other cases. Otsikini, the buffalo bean <coughs> is a very important plant. In fact, the first summer moon uh, that we're going to come to, Apistishkitsatos, the flower moon, is named after um, after these plants, their yellow flowers. And some people even call it Otsikiniatos, the, the moon of this buffalo bean. Otsikin in Blackfoot refers to the way that the flower looks like a, like a shoe, like a moccasin shaped like a moccasin. Um, in English they're called buffalo bean or sometimes golden bean. It's a it's a poisonous legume. You don't want to eat it. Um, but in Blackfoot history it has some significance, which I will describe when we get to Apistiskitsatos, the flower moon. But you might see these cropping out um, of exposed areas around your sites. So I thought I should show what the what the first shoots look like. This is yellow bells. Um, this is an edible root plant. Uh, the roots kind of kind of like any other like lily um, type of a root. Uh, it's just a what would you call it? It's a bulb. It's a white. It's a white bulb and uh, edible raw or cooked. And these grow in, they love these areas, these kind of uh, coolie meadow areas where the grass is very thick and flat and matted down. Um, for some reason, the yellow bells seem to thrive even in that seemingly strangulated um, environment. But they do well there. Um, they're a plant that does not do well to to recover from um, over harvesting so my recommendation is if you want to add yellow bell to your diet don't take too many wild ones uh, but collect the seeds and see if you can get some to grow uh, as a crop for yourself they really emerge before the grass starts growing so you could potentially even even grow them in your yard um, before the first lawn mowing, you know. But yeah, if you if you come across them in the wild, harvest some, you know, eat some for sure. Um, but just bear in mind that they don't do well to over harvesting. They don't bounce back quickly. So low town sendia. <clears throat> this is actually the first flower that I see opening um, in my area. Motown Cindy. I don't have a Blackfoot name for it or any traditional use notes for it, but uh, I'm sure it had some in the past. And I'm probably going to end up being the one to um, work on naming some of these plants that their Blackfoot names are, are lost. Bullberry is another one of the first flowers. It might even be the first um, or the second and it ends up being the last berry of the season you know the one that we the one that we harvest in the winter 
first and second winter moons. In Blackfoot, the name for this plant is Meeksinitsim, which refers to the red berry that it grows. They're looking at uh, Meeksinitsim right now as, uh, as I record this lecture. Um, there's kind of a trending news story going around about this plant, this berry potentially being the uh, the next marketable superfood. <laughs> but we'll see what happens with that. Certainly, it's a it's an important part of the Blackfoot diet. Always has been. The golden currants, red currants, and black currants will all leaf out during sa'akisam. Uh, these plants are called in Blackfoot Sarsi Paksini Siman, which means the Sarsi's gooseberry. Um, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a current, and so is the gooseberry. Basically, it's a kind of a current, large current. So they'll be leafing out, and that's some of the things that, you know, you should notice around your sites with the plants. Unless you're very far north, you're going to be seeing other things that I don't see down here. The beavers, Xiskstucky, will be out and about. There's no more ice on their pond <laughs> or on their river. And so they'll be going out doing their thing and uh, harvesting some of the new um, fresh fruit foods. They haven't had anything fresh for most of the winter. It takes a while usually for them to adjust to my presence when they, when they first, you know, have access to open water again. They got to kind of get used to me. And if I'm not there with, with uh, really repetitive frequency during the time that they're around, they don't get used to me. They'll, they'll do the, they'll, you know, make the alarm with the tail slap um, at me. But there have been years where Mahoney and I have went out and sat every night um, and been with the beavers and, and they, of course, stop being alarmed at that point and even approach us. This is one of the beavers that we got to know that I, I used to call um, meaning the first to dive. These are some uh, bulrush stems. Beavers gather and bring it into the lodge. More of the more of the creation of the new bedding. Um, you'll see them if you if you if you're there at the at the right times, um, you'll see them replacing the bedding, the winter bedding in their lodge uh, with new stuff. And you might see them wrestling around, enjoying the, the beaver life. This is a couple of beavers wrestling, <laughs> grooming, you know. Their, their very close friend, the muskrat, meets Hopski. Meets Hopski is an important uh, animal uh, he, that plays a role in some of the Blackfoot stories and some of the medicine, some of the bundles. Um, he's known for being able to dive and to be underwater for, for long stints of time. And so um, there was a story about the Great Flood here where Nopi and all of the animals, or the surviving animals, ended up in the mountaintops. And um, the water was all over the earth. And Nopi was sending down animals to try to find some mud at the bottom to recreate the earth with. Several animals um, passed away trying to accomplish this. Only Misopski was able to come up with a bit of mud in his claw. Um, he too passed away when that when he when he did that, but uh, it was enough of the earth to to recreate the land. And so, um, as a result of this, or in association with this, um, in medicine, Mitsubishi is the one that can go deep. Um, deep inside of you. And he's known as, uh, for cleansing in particular. 
um, there's ceremonies where the people who are the initiates in the ceremony are not allowed to touch themselves, touch their own bodies if they have sweat or they're itching or whatever. But they can borrow um, the skins of the muskrat from a beaver man and they can use that to wipe themselves off with, to clean themselves off, clean the sweat, tend to itches and all of this kind of a thing. Um, these are the okeks, the people who, who sit the sun dance. Um, are, are one who will do this. But there are others who use the, the uh, muskrat. Um, a lot of people who, a lot of the elders, or not a lot of them, but some of them, I should say, some of them who are officiating a lot of ceremonies and painting a lot of faces will use a muskrat skin um, to, to wop, wipe the paint off of their hands with. It's a cleanser. Okay. And if you and if you come to a beaver man and you got something deep inside of you that needs to be cleansed, this is what will be used: is the muskrat. Looking underwater <laughs> or along the edges, um, you might notice the first snail crop of the year: Physa snails. I haven't eaten any of these, but I imagine they would be. Edible. We have a, a small spider, a small wolf spider called a six spotted fishing spider that walks on the water surface. And um, fishing is, of course, a misnomer. Somebody had doctored an image of one of these spiders um, with, a, with a large fish one time. And so their reputation became. Be came that they could catch fish, but that's not the case. <laughs> so basically they walk on the surface of the water and look for insects, right? Just like any ground, uh, ground moving wolf spider would. Another water walker is the kayak pond skater, who you'll see out as soon as the water is open. In rainy days, We'd be shifting from snow to rain during this lunar cycle, of course. We get some rainy days, and those days, those days can be wormy days. So you get earthworms rising up. Uh, something about how, how they look kind of purplish, you know. Our only regional um, slug. There are occasions when people spot other species of slugs, but those species are usually brought in somehow um, from BC. There's not an active population of them in Alberta or Montana. The only slug that we do have an active population of, that anybody knows of at least, is this small meadow slug. And they are very small. This is a, this is a, a much enlarged image. Turning over, you know, logs and stuff, finding meadow slugs, finding worms. You also find other things, of course. This is a egg sac from probably another wolf spider. Though what species, I don't know. And you can see that it's open. There's a, a kind of an opening here. They've already, the eggs of the spiders have already hatched. Or they've been taken. The eggs have been taken. It's another little pocket of eggs. I don't know who this belongs to. Sometimes you'll find different grubs. Yellow jacket queens finishing their, their hibernation. Hornet queens. Um, those that are active include this um, black Arentera ichneumon wasp. Uh, ichneumon wasps are the wasps that have this large ovipositor on the back, that black tube you see coming out of the back of her, used to deposit eggs. Um, often 
parasitically inside of hosts. Kind of a needle that's inserted in and eggs laid in them and then the the animal, whoever it lays it in, uh, often becomes kind of a zombie to the wasp larvae that are eating their way, um, eating them alive. This happens a lot to grasshoppers, crickets. Long soil centipedes. Um, it's not your everyday soil centipede that you see here, the smaller orange one, but sometimes you'll come across this longer one. Cuckoo larva. <laughs> this is also known as the red flat bark beetle larva. Um, the cuckoo juice lives in the poplar bark, cottonwood bark, and feeds off of the um, poplar borer beetle uh, pupa and larva. You might find rove beetles active under logs and such. It's a crab-like rove beetle. Woodland ground beetle, very luminescent. I don't know a whole lot about the life history of, of these insects. Insects are an ongoing project for me and I've mostly uh, been focused mostly on their identification. You know, at this point, um, I need to learn more about their life history. This is a click beetle, one of several species we have, but this is probably the most common click beetle that I come across. This one, I don't even know, but it, it's out during the duck moon. It's a carry-on beetle, one of several species we have here found underneath dead animals. <laughs> Don't forget to turn over the dead animals you come across. You might find interesting insects. Um, cowpath tiger beetles will be mating. This is the black morph variation of the cowpath tiger beetle. There's also a brilliant green morph color variation. These beetles are uh, they're kind of famous on the international scene because a lot of guys like to keep them as pets in terrariums and they just throw little insects in there and watch these guys um, tear them apart. And when you look up, look at these beetles closely uh, face on, they have giant mandibles and they're, they, they're called tiger beetles because they look rather fierce. Um, so yeah, people will keep them in pets. Uh, as pets, not only here in North America, there's a there's an international trade, um, and there's all kinds of tiger beetles here in southern Alberta. A lot of them have very, you know, brilliant looking um, colorations and such. So there is a little bit of a trade um, of of these animals leaving Alberta, uh, being collected and sold on the international market. It's a darkling beetle, pretty much a, a giant big stink beetle. beetle. You'll find them roving on the ground. Um, they eat like carrion and stuff like that. Other insects. Ligus bug. Closest looking bug to a cockroach we have. <laughs> Maybe not quite as close as the giant water bug, but pretty close. Hoverflies. See some hoverflies moving around. Often at my house, I will find case bear moth larvae um, climbing around on the outside of my house looking for areas to pupate. Um, this case that they carry is made up of all kinds of little things that they've gathered from their environments, all kinds of little bits of glass and sand and what have you. Sorry about that. Just getting a phone call. Um, some of the very common 
a bunny you'll see in Blackfoot all moths and butterflies are called a bunny and um, they're associated with dreams somebody gets a dream sometimes he'll say they're visited by a bunny apics, the, the moth people um, this is a clover looper one of the most common moths you'll see during Sa'aki, some uh, daytime moth anyway You'll also probably encounter morning cloak butterflies, some of the first to emerge. It's the eastern parson spider. It's fairly large, not tarantula large, but it's a fairly large spider that lives in the poplar trees. Find a tree that has bark that's falling off of it. Sometimes under that bark you'll encounter these parson spiders. In the grooves of the bark itself you might find this guy, the elegant crab spider. Very tiny little, extremely camouflaged spider on the, on the cottonwood bark. A lot of people are concerned about the wood ticks. We do have wood ticks here. And, um, you know, it's very possible to get them, depending on where you're moving around. <laughs> I have an area at Spopikimi where I study that I, I call the tick zone um, because there's a lot of wood ticks there. And the reason the wood ticks are all there is because there's also a good population of um, the mountain cottontail rabbits. So yeah, ticks come out. It's time to be concerned about ticks if you want to be concerned about them. Um, we don't have many cases of Lyme disease coming from ticks in Blackfoot territory yet. But who knows about the future? <laughs> Moving on to small passerines, little birds. Uh, you probably will encounter house finches coming more and more into their breeding plumage. Mach skinny beak, see, this is basically the red head bird. And this is a new name. This is a name that the elders came up with working with one of my, one of my graduate students. Mach skinny beak, see. <coughs> of course, the male robins have a strong presence during this lunar cycle. This is Atgakais, the orange breast, or yellow breast. Atgakoy in Blackfoot is uh, yellow slash orange. <laughs> yellow slash orange. So this is the orange breast American robin. Saki kaku, the morning doves return. In the rivers, on the fields, in the rocky open areas, anywhere where this tiny little bird can run around and see what's coming from a distance, you'll find these guys, killdeer, soyotakska. Soyotakska, almost like an underwater shadow. <laughs> Um, and they'll be mating this time of year too. They, they arrive, um, usually a moon or, or so earlier, but, uh, during Sa'aki, some, you might encounter them. You might witness them mating. They do a little, a little dance and, uh, and then the mating is rather quick after the, after the dance. On the prairies... You'll be hearing the sounds of um, the Western Meadowlark. A lot of people think that in Blackfoot means that their anus is <laughs> flaring out. Um, that's what it kind of sounds like in Blackfoot. 
but that's that's not what it's referring to. This is referring to the way that the doors of their nests, their ground nests, open, flare out. <laughs> People always think it uh, it refers to their anus. There's a a series of four songs that they sing. There's words for those songs in Blackfoot that uh, I think some people know one or two of them still. I don't know any of them. Um, I, have, I have English translations somewhere, so something I might want to learn. But those those four songs that they sing um, in the past were paid attention to phonologically because they go in series um, as the season progresses. The male red-winged blackbirds will be returning during Sa'akitsam. Their name is Imachkomeniksini, which basically means the red-winged blackbird. Um, in in Blackfoot, Ksini is a, is the cowbird, the bird that used to live with the buffalo, which is a little blackbird. And all the other small blackbirds are categorized with it. Is part of the Xenix, so this is the Machkomini Xeni, the red winged blackbird. Um, this is the common grackle, our largest blackbird. They return during Sa'aki some as well. You'll find them around some of the wetlands. And their name is Omachsaxin, which means the, the large um, little cowbird. You might see mountain bluebirds at your sites. Otskois is see the bluebird in Blackfoot. I have uh, in some some of the areas that I walk around in, people have put um, bluebird nests out. So I do have a little bluebird population in the places where I go. Siksikapansi, the tree swallows return just in time as the uh, insects are just starting to emerge you start getting these little clouds of of midges on the warm days but uh, they push the limit they get here as quick as they can some days it's very cold like the day that I took this picture and they're just huddled together on a wire there's no food um, and they're and it's cold and they're just trying to keep warm some of the uh, larger birds returning, Apipisios, which is the the white belted bird. This is the northern harrier, one of our hawks, the only hawk to nest on the ground here. Um, you'll see them flying low, gliding low over the prairies. Very distinct uh, if you see them from above, which you often will. And you'll, you'll see that white band at the base of their tail, very distinctive white band. The mistaken thunderbird, or osprey, will come back when the, when the water's open. has to have the waters open because these guys have a 100% fish diet. Sikhpoyetapanikim. The black greasy hawk, <laughs> aka Swanson's hawk. Um, I think they're called Sikhpoyetapanikim, black and greasy, because some variation, some color variations of this hawk is just all black. It's all sooty black. The most common variation that you see is this one here, though. It's got the dark hood. Looks much like a red tail, sounds like a red tail. Same call. Same voice, but uh, but a little bit of a different look. May still the American crow is back, and not only back, but nest building during Sa'aki Sum. They're a little bit behind their corvid relatives, the magpies, who by the end of this lunar cycle at least will have eggs in their nests. The owls of the previous lunar cycle who were sitting on nests um, will now have fledglings or 
not even quite fledglings, but little puffy <laughs> hatchling owls, about half the size of their parents. But they'll grow pretty quick. Painted turtles <clears throat> should emerge by the end of the lunar cycle as things warm up. Spope bee, they're called spope bee in Blackfoot, meaning they sit on top. We're going to talk more about them in the next lunar cycle. <laughs> about the same time the spope beaks come out, also my friends, uh, the prairie rattlesnakes, omaxis cheeks and eggs. They'll stick close to their dens during this lunar cycle, but they'll be out basking on the warmer days. So yeah, those are some of the things that you'll see. This concludes the second part of this lecture for the duck moon. Um, some years, like the current year, this will be the final and seventh winter moon. This happens whenever there's a sametsiki, some or deceptive mood that comes in, basically like the, the leap year, but it comes every third or fourth lunar cycle. So some years, like this year, this will be the last winter moon. Um, other years, it will be the lunar cycle that we're coming into that, uh, that I'll be introducing next, which will be Matsi Kapisaki, some the frog moon. So we'll talk about that when we get there. Yeah.